number seven ministries the spirit of the lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed number seven ministries Today's sermon is called Obedience or Sacrifice. And in this message, I'm going to biblically define the difference between obedience or sacrifice according to what God has to say about the two and how God feels about the two. All right, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, it says, Why do you ask me? about what is good, Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, if you want to enter life. Now, I want to stop right there because, first of all, it says that this is Jesus speaking to a person. And when Jesus says, if, that means that we as humans have a choice means that we have free will in this particular area that Jesus is getting ready to address. And, and actually, what Jesus is getting ready to address is a matter of salvation. It's a matter of salvation. Jesus replied, there is only one who is good if you want to enter life. Now, is Jesus talking about this life in this world, or is he talking about the next life to come? I would say that most theologians and most Holy Ghost-filled Christians would say that Jesus is getting ready to talk about the life to come after we die, eternal heaven. Jesus said, if you want to enter life, obey the commandments. He said, obey. Obey. Obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, and actually you have to give the man credit. Which ones? That's a nice question and reply. Which commandments? He showed interest in what Jesus was talking about. He showed interest in wanting to enter into life. That's why he said which one, because he was getting ready to evaluate his own life to see if he was eligible and to see if he qualified for the next life to come. I believe that's why he said which one. So he could analyze, is he obeying it or is he disobeying it? Which one, the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder. Do we have any murderers here? Well, it depends on what definition that we're going by. Because Jesus set the bar at a higher standard. He said, actually, if you had hatred in your heart for your brother, you've committed murder. Not according to Judge Judy. According to Judge Judy, you can hate people all you want as long as you don't physically kill them. So Jesus' standard is actually above Judge Judy's standard. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? So, first of all, this man was talking to God, and he said, all those things that you just mentioned, I kept that. So with that being said, you have to give this man some credit. Because in that day and age, they were killing people. 
They were committing adultery back then. They were stealing. They were disrespecting their parents. They were giving false witness. And this man said, all of that have I done. And Jesus said, never said, no, you didn't do that. So give the man some credit. Because I'm going to tell you some of these things that this man has done, I haven't done. I've been guilty of almost everything that Jesus just said just now. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even stand face to face to Jesus and said all this I've done. I would say uh, guilty, guilty, <laughs> guilty, guilty, guilty. The message is obedience or sacrifice. Jesus said, if you want to enter into life, obey. Uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 21 and verse 22. Okay? But then when it... This rich young ruler disobeyed Jesus. So yeah, he was sacrificing his life in all these different areas, which was good. But when it came time to Jesus to give this man a command of what to do, a spoken word of what to do because of pride, because of rebellion, this man disobeyed Jesus and was Jesus pleased with this man? No. No, he was not pleased at all. Was Jesus pleased that he did all those other things or didn't do all those things? Yeah, that was nice. But Jesus knew that he was willing to sacrifice certain things in his life, but he wasn't willing to obey. And Jesus was more concerned about his obedience than his own personal sacrifice. We have to evaluate our own lives. And we have to remember this, that when God speaks to our heart, when God speaks to our spirit, when God speaks to our soul, and he tells us to do something, that's still small voice. And sometimes God screams at us, not people, God will scream at us. He will speak so loud and tug at your heart, so powerful that you feel like you're going to shut down if you don't listen to him. But he doesn't always speak that way. So when he speaks to us and tells us to obey, we have to obey him. We have to obey him. And if we go out and sacrifice and do all this other stuff, but then we disobey him in the area of the thing that he told us to do, God overlooks all that sacrifice that we've done and he only looks at our disobedience. Remember, Jesus said, if you want to enter into life, obey my commandments. Was he talking about the Ten Commandments? We just got a revelation that no, he wasn't. He was talking about his spoken word when he speaks to you. Yeah, you can obey all of the law to a T, but then when God tells you to do something because you have a spirit of pride and rebellion, you disobey. And God wants us to obey on a daily basis. And if we don't obey, he's going to ask us to repent. Repent of that sin, that disobedience. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Why? This is the question, why? Why is obedience better than sacrifice? Why? I asked myself this, why? God, why is obedience better than sacrifice? I understand this Bible verse. I understand that these people were sacrificing animals in an attempt to please God. But in the Old Testament, when they thought that salvation was through sacrifice, even then, the Bible says, obedience is better than sacrifice. That's a shocker. That's a shocker. So my question is, why, Lord? What is it about obedience that pleases you, and what is it about sacrifice 
that doesn't please you as much. And I heard the Lord tell me this, that obedience is us doing what God wants us to do. And sacrifice is what we want to do. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3. To do what is right, which means obey, is just, is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So if we look at Cain and Abel, if we look at what Cain and Abel did, Cain and Abel were in the both, they're both in the same opportunity where they could have obeyed God. But if you look at the details and the time and the energy and the labor that was involved between what Cain did and what Abel did, you could actually find out that Cain had a greater sacrifice than Abel. You could see that if you've ever had your own garden, you know that it takes time. It takes time to uh, produce vegetables and fruit. Abel, he grabbed an animal, killed it, done. So sometimes we do things harder than we have to. Sometimes we go out and do all these strenuous, laborious things. But I'm going to tell you that as we do our strenuous, laborious things as sacrifice, our disobedience to God is not compensated by sacrifice. And sometimes the more we disobey God, the more we sacrifice in the name of God. Sometimes the more we're rebellious, the more we do for God, the more we appear to be religious. And we have all this ministry stuff. And it looks glorious. But God said, no, I want you to obey me, and that will glorify me more than all of your sacrificing. Now, Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, 17, and 18. Says, and when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they're fasting. Do you know what that tells me right there? that some people go on fast not as obedience to God, but as a sacrifice to God. And the reason why they're sacrificing is not actually to please God, but to please themselves so that they can receive praises of people to appear more spiritual than they actually are. Because in order to be spiritual, you're going to have to obey the Spirit. Not sacrifice out of flesh or sacrifice out of pride. So some people are making great, tremendous sacrifices, not out of humility, not out of love, not out of obedience, but more out of pride. So when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret so have, as Christians, have you ever seen someone come up to you and grab their belly and they just had to tell you? They had to call you up. You, you were at home reading your Bible and they interrupted you to inform you that they were fasting. I just want to let you know. They had to call you and tell you that they're fasting. And the next time you... The next time you see them, they grab their belly, they're hunched over, almost look like they need a cane. And their face is so disfigured, they look like the elephant man because they're really trying to portray an image so that the world knows that they're going without food for the last five minutes. I'm telling you, my reaction that you'll receive from me if you call me, if you call my office and you say, you know, I really want to let you know I was going on a fast, I'll feed into it. No! You don't say. 
You're on a fast? How long has it been? It's been at least an hour. Wow, are you going to be all right? Do you need some medical attention? <laughs> Praying for you. Come on, don't do that. Don't tell nobody. I understand if you're married, you have to, your wife is going to find out why you're not eating. Or you better tell her or she's going to be mad that you're not eating or cooking. And you might, don't do that. Romans chapter 14, verse 14. So nothing in and of itself, according to this Bible verse, or unclean, except for to the individual that deems it to be unclean. So does that mean that we could smoke crack, cocaine, and shoot up heroin, and fornicate with a bunch of prostitutes, because we deem it to be clean? No, that's not what it's saying. But I'll tell you this. What is a sacrifice and what is obedience? I'm going to tell you that there is nothing in and of itself that is either obedience or sacrifice. Nothing in and of itself is actually sacrifice or obedience. Anything that you can tell me, anything that you can imagine, anything that you could come up with, anything that you can speak, can be both obedience or sacrifice. And what depends on whether it's obedience or sacrifice? God. God determines whether it's obedience or sacrifice. A casing point is this. You have a certain individual who is faithful and loyal to attending his local church services. And he will never miss one church service. But then God tells him when he goes home to stop going on raping tangents at 2 o'clock in the morning. Every day after he attends his church service at 2 o'clock in the morning he goes out and rapes random women and God is saying I'm not mad at you that you never miss a church service that's fantastic but I want you to obey me in this area of your life where you keep raping these women at 2 o'clock in the morning. So that church service that he faithful and loyally attends every service is a sacrifice to him. But the area of where he's raping women is a disobedience to him. Another example. Another individual never once goes out at 2 o'clock in the morning and rapes anyone. But he doesn't go to church ever. And God is telling him to go to church. But he doesn't want to go to church, so he's disobeying God when God is telling him to go to a church service. Do you see, both things can be either obedience or sacrifice depending on what God is speaking to us. Smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, fornicating, killing, anything can be a form of sacrifice or disobedience. In my area, when I first became a Christian, God went down all the way from my head to my toe, and God spoke to me. I didn't know anything about church. I didn't go to church, never read the Bible, and God spoke to me outside of people. God spoke to me himself. And he told me, I want you to stop doing this. And then he said, I want you to stop doing this. And then I want you to stop doing this. So then as I was doing it, it wasn't a sacrifice. It was actually me obeying God. Now, the thing that I was obeying God, God showed me he didn't actually care about what I was doing. He cared about the fact that I was actually obeying him. You see what I'm saying? If God uh, tells you to stop uh, swearing, 
swearing, everything that comes out of our mouth is a curse word. God doesn't care the fact that you're cursing. He cares the fact that he told you to stop cursing and you are disobeying him. Remember, Jesus said, I want you to obey my commandments. Not the Ten Commandments, whatever he tells you to do. Why? Because he's telling us what to do to protect us, to save us, and to love us. And because he wants to be our father. And true fathers tell their children what to do. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. It's saying to the church that rebellion is like the sin of divination. If we keep disobeying God over and over and over, then our disobedience actually turns into rebellion. And if we start to be rebellious against God, the Bible is saying that it's like the sin of divination which is like witchcraft, which is demonic, which is evil. So when God keeps telling us to do something and we keep disobeying him, we, in the spiritual realm, we open up the door for Satan to manipulate us in all areas of our life and for Satan to use us like a puppet. And we create strings from our soul to the kingdom of hell. If we continue in disobedience to the Lord. And this is how our conscience that God gave every human being, which means with knowledge, with knowledge of God, starts to die. And when our conscience dies through disobedience, which will enter or evolve into rebellion, then our eyes start to be shut to what's true and what's a lie, what's right and what's wrong. And then we actually start to die spiritually. And I don't believe it happens like that. I believe it's a process. But if we have not obeyed God, it's never too late to repent and ask Jesus to forgive you for your disobedience before it turns into rebellion. It's never too late. To him that is joined to the living, there is hope. For better is a living dog than a dead lion. If you're alive in this earth, if you're walking amongst the living, there's always hope. It doesn't matter how much you messed up. I am like Apostle Paul when he said, I'm the chief sinner. He said that before I was born. Had he known I was born, he would have said, that man is the chief sinner. And been talking about me. So even someone like myself who has gone far away from God, we're still within hope. If you have family members, friends that are into all kinds of crazy stuff, there's always hope for them. That's why we should have faith in God and trust in him. And in the way of uh, having a spirit of rebellion, I believe a lot of this stems from our natural parents or lack thereof. Children nowadays in 2012 don't have fathers disciplining them. The Bible says spare the rod and spoil the child. And if they don't get disciplined in the upbringing, it sets a platform for a wild thing, for a spirit of rebellion to take place. And if that is their upbringing, if anyone ever comes along through the word of God or not, through the spirit of God or not, as soon as they tell them to do something, they immediately shut down, they immediately rebel, and they re immediately resist. And I'm going to tell you, those people are easily manipulated by the right person. Whenever you tell them to do something, they do the opposite. So if you want them to do something, you tell them the opposite. I command you not to donate one penny. I command you in the name of Jesus, don't give a penny to this ministry. And they sell all they have. They go out and clean their bank account up. They sell all their clothes, their house, their dog, and they give everything. Why? Just because they, they have to do the opposite of what they're being told to do. I could easily manipulate. I could e you could even work their pride. I'm not saying I do that. I'm saying I know what they'll do. 
because it's a spirit. And the same thing with the pride. If you have someone or you know someone that's just full of pride, they can be easily manipulated because of their pride. You know, I bet you that you don't know how to mop the church. I don't think you know how to do it. I'll show him. I'll mop the church. <laughs> I bet you you can't even figure out how to operate this $300 vacuum cleaner. And they'll be vacuuming up a storm. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8. So pride, pride is a reason why certain individuals will disobey God because of their pride. And pride has to do with their flesh and their flesh has to do with their own understanding and their own understanding has to do with their own logic and their own intelligence. And because of their pride, they will disobey God because in their own insanity, they've concluded that they know better than God knows. My wife is my best friend. I think more important than anything else, you have to uh, be a friend. You have to, your wife should be, or your husband should really be your best friend. If you can't build that friendship, the romance aspect will fade. Uh, right now we have a, a driven world where we're trying to move ahead and, and be our own person and we're not willing to sacrifice to the marriage. And the marriage has to come first. Um, of course, Christ has to be in it. As he sacrificed for his church, we need to be sacrificial in our marriages. Very simple. The other problem is communication. We're busy communicating with everybody else except our spouses. And uh, it's a problem today. Uh, we're on email, we're on Facebook, we're on this, we're on that, and we're communicating with everyone else but the person that's in the house with you. We've been married uh, uh, December the 20th of this year, will be 32 years. People don't stick to commitments. Um, when you take your wedding vows, I mean, you commit to uh, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and you actually make a covenant, and I think that most people don't understand what a covenant relationship is. That means that two parties agree, they come together, and they commit to making things work. First of all, we need to make sure that it's God's will, and that we are engaging in godliness. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And I believe that one of the reasons why that marriage is like it is, is because it's too easy, first of all, to get out. We've been married six years, dating me. So a lot of people in the church are currently in blended families right now. I think we've removed God out of a lot of the systems, our, our school systems, our court systems, and even from the family standpoint. A lot of families are, it's a fast paced moving world now. They don't sit down to eat anymore. They don't pray before meals. Um, rarely do you see the whole family at the church in one body. They're either off in separate parts of the church even. The foundation of marriage is based on a three court strand and a lot of families are living a one or two court strand. Um, you know, with a three court strand, it's you, your wife, and God. As it makes up a strand, it's not easily broken.